This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Media. I'm Randy Moggins. The website is offplanetmedia.net and offplanetradio.com. And uh, we're going to come full tilt on a subject that we covered over, well, almost exactly a year ago, as a matter of fact. We're going to revisit Standing Rock as a, let's just say, reclaimed battleground and a reconstituted platform for moving forward with some very exciting changes that are taking place in the, um, the Lakota Sioux Nation, as well as uh, hopefully bleeding out into the culture at large. This has to do with um, the Osseti Sakawin Energy Summit at Standing Rock, put on by the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And, and uh, that's occurring, let's see, January 12th, 13th, 2018. And with me to talk about all the things that have led up to this moment and the details of what is going on in the background is uh, a colleague, a friend, a leading advocate of low energy nuclear reaction power, cold fusion, free energy, an activist on many fronts. Uh, I welcome back to the program, James Martinez. James, welcome. Oh, thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, I guess we just dig right into it because it looks like you've got a lot here to cover. Obviously, a year ago, we were looking at a a very different situation than what we are now at Standing Rock, um, given that at that time it was an occupied um, territory and it was a contested territory occupied by police and military units. And uh, at that time, it was, of course, extremely cold and in brutal conditions uh, for the people on the ground. But it was indeed, I guess you would call, uh, uh, the battle that has led to the moment we're in right now. So give us the background on what's going on there, your involvement with it, and the details of what we can expect to see come out of the summit, James. Okay, so a little over a year ago uh, was one of the biggest uh, peaceful protests in U.S. history where veterans came from all over the world to assemble to protect the water protectors there uh, at the um, camp there located on on Lakota Lakota Sioux land. Every major media outlet was there. It was covered internationally. Um, This is the first time in history where um, you had actual defense contractors that were working for oil companies, um, uh, Tiger Swan specifically is the name of the people that were hired by energy transfer partners to represent the oil companies that came in and brought military equipment to face off with peaceful uh, protesters. They were unarmed. So uh, as you know, um, Wesley Clark and I were the people that organized that with the Lakota Sioux government. and. Uh, Phyllis Young greenlit, did the green light on that, and uh, Leslie Clark put in their work order, and then the call was put out, and then eventually there was thousands of people. There's, we had to turn people away. There were so many people there. But the, the emphasis and the entire issue had to do with oil, uh, treaty rights, energy, and uh, rule of law, uh, all of which were sitting at the table and got the the uh, office of the president uh, on the line. And that was the first time ever where the entire world was watching uh, this one particular event going on. So eventually uh, that whole call to duty was kind of dissembled over a period of time. The camp was disbanded Mm -hmm. and the whole thing changed. And then what everybody uh, feared actually happened. And some people know there that uh, there's been oil spills in the surrounding areas already. 
which is exactly what yeah, almost did immediately not. within almost a month of the time that the the protests broke up we be, we had our first uh our first leak out there exactly exactly so um all the effort all the commotion all the call out for uh the proper authorities to, to do the right thing um that now today is uh, now accumulated to at least 53 federal lawsuits um physical damage uh to people that were there um all of which did not get the credit they deserve um and uh a lot of people uh dispersed after that uh i'm only in touch with the 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 original um lakota uh sue members from that everybody else having to do with that they all dispersed mm -hmm. but here's what's here's what has happened um uh, Phyllis Young uh, was summoned by MIT University uh, to receive the Defiance Award for what took place at Standing Rock. And I received a call from her and she said, you know, I've, I've been uh, asked to come receive this award by a university called MIT. And I said, do you know who MIT is? And I said, well, uh, they're, they're, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's the most, one of the most prestigious technical colleges in the world and it also happens to be the college where the cold fusion controversy started now for those of people that are listening that may not know it's the standing rock sioux tribe government which was the first government ever to put in their government minutes that they wanted and this energy policy to be installed on sovereign land okay so she went to go receive this award uh, at mit um, at which time it was filmed. It'll be coming out in a, a documentary film called End of the Line, which will probably be released this summer. And um, uh, her receiving the award, and during her speech, um, she said to the audience, which is about a thousand people there, um, that uh, they wanted to continue this fight and ask MIT to join them to come up with energy solutions for the particular problems that they're having there that fit into their wants and needs, but also fit into the wants and needs of um, countries all over the world that are looking to transition over to uh, a, a clean, green economy. So what has happened is they agreed to it, MIT agreed to it. Um, the director of the media lab there is Megan uh, Smith, I believe is her name, and she used to be the um, chief technical officer under President Obama. They are there with five people or so um, that are going to be discussing all the latest information having to do with energy policy, currency, which is related to energy policy, um, and also uh, all the various uh, green tech from solar to wind to LNR fusion will be discussed, even though that's, uh, that's the big hush-hush subject there that's going to have to be a uh, it's going to be a big face off there uh, mm -hmm. when I arrive because uh, I'm not going to allow them to uh, uh, push that under the, the rug, so to speak. Um, so this is what's coming. This is a historical event. This has never happened before that the you know, most prestigious technical college in the world is now going to one of the poorest nations that's forgotten by the American people. So it's a definite historical uh, thing that's about to occur. So in the background over the last year, there have been numerous developments that have sort of percolated up that gave signals that we may be at the dawn of the release of low energy nuclear reaction, Lanner, cold fusion. Uh, can you give us a little bit of indication as to where we are in the plot line in terms of seeing something that we would call the release of free energy? Yeah, there's two companies. Actually, there's three companies that are the kind of the leaders. There's Clean Planet, which is a Japanese company. Uh, there's Andrea Rossi's company. And then there's a company called Berluin Energy, which is located in uh, uh, up in Northern California in uh, Berkeley area. Mm -hmm. And it is these three that are doing the race uh, for release. Now, I know uh, Andrea Rossi fairly well. And I've interviewed him many times. And he, the, the first uh, lawsuit, actually, in the cold fusion free energy uh, world 
uh, was settled this year, actually, um, with Tom Darden and Andrea Rossi having to do with his uh, devices that were uh, set to uh, be commercialized within the next year or two. Um, he is completely separate from everybody else and very controversial guy. A lot of people have good things to say about him. A lot of people have bad things to say about him. And the other, the other company that is up there leading the way is uh, Japan uh, with a um, company called uh, Clean Planet. Now, Japan, as far as I'm concerned, is leading. They're leading because they have congruency between the people, the government, and the universities and they're all agreement. They're all in agreement to move this technology forward. They also have Fukushima, which certainly anybody that's lived in the shadows of a nuclear disaster knows that pushes this whole agenda forward about five ticks because of the fact that you're facing the kind of ecological and human disaster as a result of the use of this the, the nuclear power. So exactly, exactly. Nobody in the world should ever support nuclear energy ever again based upon what's happened with that. It's over. They, 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 that is one of the biggest disasters facing the entire world. It's not in the press anywhere. They've done a complete blackout on it. And it's very interesting to me that, you know, that reality now for the world, but especially this country since we live here, is based upon what we see on the internet and what we see printed on the page, which it isn't. At all. Right. It's suppressed. Everything. Yes. And people run around on their high horses talking about whatever they're talking about in a very uh, misdirected, misinformed, uh, uneducated uh, response. So Japan, they should be real motivated since they've polluted the entire Pacific Ocean and practically destroyed it. And it's that many people can perceive that as an act of terrorism. So you bet they would be uh, in agreement about moving forward with uh, free energy and doing so with complete congruency between their government, the public, and their universities. Now, here comes the other company, Berlin Energy, located in Berkeley. Um, they have had recent visits by the cryptocurrency crowd that I know about because I arranged them. Um, they, with the right funding, um, they're about three years out from delivering a commercial device. Now, um, when I arrive at uh, Standing Rock, um, I will be addressing the government there, and I will be addressing on video footage to go to the White House. Because what's interesting to me, and should be interesting to your audience, is that we have this technology. The Navy's known about it since the very beginning. You're, you're not, most of the public is still not awake to what the hell is really going on here. They're still not awake to the fact that uh, you've got disruptive technology that's sitting on the table, literally, and private industry is not financing it. They're financing everything else. Startup companies, all, this, all sorts of different things, but they're not dumping money into this. So, that is going to be discussed, and from what I heard from my contacts in Washington, that uh, the Department of Energy um, is actually being friendly on this situation and is actually moving ahead because I know about the Department of Energy is in negotiations with Berlin Energy right now for their technology. So it's imminent this thing is going to be coming out sooner or later because here's what's happening. This is what's the interesting part is you know and you've been examining – through social media and through your broadcasts, the situation with these cryptocurrencies, correct? Correct, yep. And you know the deal, that these are energy-based. Absolutely. Without the, Absolutely. without the energy, you've got nothing, this right? Is, this is energy-intensive. When you look at the, uh, the mining of, of uh, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum and the energy output that's required in order to solve the mathematical problems that create the blockchains. Exactly. Now, I got a call from uh, a relative stranger 
that um, started babbling on to me about cryptocurrencies. And I said, well, you know, that's great and everything. It's got some great properties to it. Um, I, I, I like a lot of the features to it, but it's going to blow itself out because people are not going to be able to handle the energy means and the, the mining costs for doing all this are eventually going to blow people out and then you're going to have energy problems, period. Um, and that led to uh, conversations with some of the leaders in Bitcoin um, I spoke to Roger Veer, the Bitcoin Jesus gentleman, a couple days ago, mm-hmm. and another person high up in, in Washington State about this. And I said, you know, you better start investing in other sources of energy. Um, so this this particular subject matter is going to be discussed um, at this energy conference because all the hoopla having to do with all this um, – it, if they don't have a, a means to deal with the energy demands, forget it. It's not going to work. Will not work. Well, this is so, the uh, the crux of the matter. You know, cryptos aside for a minute, energy is a baseline economy. Without it, you there's nothing. I mean, go back through history and find who the dominant cultures were. If they were harnessing sea power, if they were harnessing human energy, whatever means of energy they were deploying determined the relative dominance of the culture. And here in 2018, on the dawn of, 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 you know, coming up into 2020, we're looking at severe changes in our society. And you, you describe the technology as disruptive. I would say it's only disruptive because of the thinking that is hardwired into the, into the current system. And exactly. I, I think what's happening with the cryptocurrencies is they're forcing an issue. Um, I just saw uh, about 10 days ago, one of the exchanges announced it was no longer going to do any transactions in Bitcoin, less than $100 because of the high cost to the miners. That tells you that already at this early stage in the development of cryptos, energy is impacting the marketplace into which these cryptocurrencies need to interact so houston we have a problem major major so ironically um when it, when i started discussing the lnr cold fusion situation not only uh coming up for this um energy summit with mit i, I managed to uh have a private meeting with one of the members of an african government a very wealthy african government and i sat down with him and he asked me, you know, I, I want you to put a team together to uh, put crypto in my country. Um, and then I proceeded to tell him, you know, what, what would happen when that was popularized, that you'd have an energy issue. And, of course, you know, I showed him all the data with Alienar and so forth. And now he's, he's actually going back and forth with some of the leaders in his country about initiating crypto installing it which would take a couple of you know years to fully integrate it and then when LENR is ready on the market prayer uh, preparing and planning that ahead uh, before uh, before it's actually arrived on the market so that it's part of their government policy as well which is a really big deal because this particular country they're wealthy very wealthy, and they they're they're one of the leading countries in Africa. And a long time ago, uh, many years ago, when people were discussing free energy and how to um, where to put it, uh, when to put it, how to put it, and the, the education thereof of um, installing free energy into the existing economic models and making it work meaning making the previous economic structures not fall to pieces so people don't get sued every five minutes. Yes, exactly. This is really a critical aspect. Oh, it's the whole thing. And you are precisely right in in stating that um, uh, our kind of cemented architecture of what an economy is uh, needs to be discussed and rethought because (laughs) I'm laughing as all these cryptocurrencies and all the stuff that's going on because people really don't even know what money is now. I hardly see anybody have any sense of what money is because everything's done electronically now. I mean, I I do see cash, 
But now most people don't have a kinesthetic feeling of moving oh, a real yes. piece of money exactly. from A to B in their hand. It's gone. Yep. It is gone. Gone. Yep. And that's the point that I have made um, on, a, on several shows that we've done with, with Cliff High as well was the fact that there is an element to this that I don't think people are looking at. It's the connection. And this goes back to the energy output, the tangible aspect of the fruits of our labors, the fruits of our intellectual properties. These are very important aspects of the human side of energy, which is something that most people don't talk about. But when you look at where we're at right now, James, and I know you know this because we've discussed it, we live in a very toxic atmosphere as a result of energy policies that simply continue to believe that megawatts and gigawatts and kilowatts and increasing magnitudes of energy pumped into pipelines and through the air was the answer to our energy problems. While at the back end of it, we were still not really looking at the source of our base fuel versus our output. Thus, for years, we've had the schizophrenic predatory energy policy, specifically in the U.S., but generally in the Western nations as well, that has been largely resulting in war, terrorism, and, and human depravity at all kinds of levels, largely because nobody's ever sat down and had the conversation of integrating our energy needs with our output, with our creative necessities, and the human capacities that need to be factored into this. This whole thing is one giant algorithm that nobody's ever run. Exactly. And the, the first step in doing that is discussing it. Like, I'm I'm working on uh, an education program with uh, one of the cold fusion advocates, um, and it's it's a it's a it's a form of um, gaming. You, you, sorry about the the uh, <laughs> ambulance going by. Sorry, but um, take a break for a second. Let, oh, there we go. So the the issue is is. There needs to be discussion about exactly what you just said. There needs to be discussion. There needs to be dialogue. You don't need to believe in free energy to have a discussion. You can say, what if? You can hypothesize and determine these things and start creating new economic models for integration of all this stuff. That stuff doesn't even, isn't even talked about at all. Other than well, a few, no, It's utterly not talked about. It's dismissed. It's belittled. We know that since the 80s, when Fleshman Pons did the original tabletop cold fusion experiments, cold fusion energy was immediately labeled as a tar baby and tossed off into the bin of history. And it has remained there over, over now almost 35 years. Yep, long time, long yeah. time. Without anybody, without anybody really ever going back and examining the feasibility or lack there, thereof. I mean, you can't even patent a cold fusion device in the United States, according to the U.S. Patent Office. Exactly. So it, this, is the, this is the conspiracy against the future, which uh, I first learned about with my colleague, uh, the late Walter Boward. And when he sat down with me and said, look, because we knew that the Eleanor situation was real way back in the very, 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 very beginning. And we said, look, this stuff is going to have to come out sooner or later. And when I look at the pollution in other, like India and China and some places in the U.S., I don't think that is the, uh, uh, that is the type of world we want to leave our children to. Because th this is the only thing that is the unifying connecting point to make people agree. I've been in rooms with people where they're, they're, they're arguing about who owns what, who has the patents, who's going to profit, how it's going to be integrated. And the only unifying thing that brings people together is children, believe it or not, and leaving the earth in a better place than, you know, when they were there leaving something behind that's cleaner and better. And I cannot see um, um, at the moment that uh, we are really moving ahead with the necessary things in energy of LENR moving forward in, in the leaps and bounds it should be, mostly because of the, uh, 
lack of education surrounding the subject and also because of um, it's not been put into prop, pop culture uh, properly. Even though there's movies about it, there's documentaries about it, there's stuff all over the internet about it, uh, it should be yeah, um, common knowledge to people and it should be demanded. It has to be demanded by people. They have to say enough is enough and uh, put their money into this and move ahead. So, so Blue and Energy is the U.S. company which is on the verge of doing this. They're, they're about two and a half years, three years out. And when they get the funding to do this, then the world is going to change dramatically. So what is going to happen at this conference with MIT is there's going to be an announcement uh, regarding the LENR. I'm not going to say what it is, um, by the existing leadership there um, to set policy with the DOA, with the Department of Energy. In other words, they're going to challenge them to get this out. Because what what I in, in discussions I've had prior to me talking to you today, um, the cryptocurrency world, they may just end up being the people that allow this thing and finance it and put it through, because they want to survive, and that's what I think is going to happen. Because uh, the the demand right now uh, is overwhelming, and it's interesting. People don't even know what money is now. <laughs> They don't know what money is now. Here's the conversation that's worth having. And I know there's a lot of crypto people that listen to this show out there because obviously we've been discussing this over the last year and with more intensity, certainly in the last six months. The people in the crypto community need to understand that they are challenging the fundamental premises of our value system, our money system. You have raised the question about money. What is it? How is it valued? If it's, not, if it's not monetized on gold, if it's not monetized on some basis, what is it? It's perception. And so now we're at a place where we can talk about perception and we can talk about perception of energy because that's what money is. So the crypto people obviously have a problem. They need huge amounts of computing power in order to build these blockchain systems and to maintain them as well. It's not just a matter of, of, of building them. This is actually building an entire cybernetic financial structure. So the people in the crypto communities should be very interested in the fact that what is in the offering here and what comes as a result of the standoff at, 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 at Standing Rock one year ago is now a completely different conversation. It is a constructive conversation. It has everything to do with working with a humane scale. Uh, what, I, what I think is interesting here, and this, is, this will tie it together, we're looking at this energy summit as a very tightly integrated conversation about a number of subjects, mainly power, currency, and how to live in accordance with the earth, which is what the native peoples on all continents have been telling us for a long time. We have the opportunity in a small scale situation to begin testing theories in a way that can impact the world at large without taking down the present power system. To the people who are involved in the old energy systems, largely the petroleum base, but coal and nuclear as well, uh, your day isn't over yet because we can't just sunset all of these programs at once. But if we don't look at the future now and begin to look at it from the standpoint of what technology can offer us, the Bitcoins are worthless. The cyber currency and all the digital systems in the world are worthless because they're just more of the same BS that the oligarchs have given us now for almost 150 years. Exactly. And something interesting happened in the last 48 hours. I, I received a phone call from uh, somebody that was at Standing Rock um, that I, I called to inform them of this uh, conference. And he said, James, I, I, I want to invite you to a private meeting that's happening up in Northern California regarding the, 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 the qubit. And I said, is that related to the D-Wave quantum computer? And, and I, he goes, I don't know. And I said, yes, yes it, is. it is. That's what it is. And this is being discussed because 
there is only, let's see, uh, three or four people, uh, or companies rather, that can even afford to have one of these. Now, if people understand what the quantum computer is capable of doing and what happens when that's going to interface with the crypto world, now we have a different discussion, don't we? We're actually talking about a multidimensional computing system. We're you talking got it. about the pure basis of energy based on the quanta, which is something that has never existed on this earth as far as I know, certainly not in any of the epochs in recorded history. Precisely. So it's we're we are we are not in Kansas anymore. We're in a completely different area. And the uh I mean some of the things having to do with crypto, um I'm for because it's I'm you know me. Nobody uh loathes the central bankers more than me. And exactly. yes, exactly. uh and anything where we can liberate ourselves from those people. Uh, is a good thing. Uh, cryptocurrencies are not perfect, but uh, let's go back to the basis of it. They, they are all energy driven. Hence, there should be massive motivation now to push LNR forward and out the door. That's what I feel. Absolutely. I mean, what I see right now when you look at this from an integrative standpoint is we are offering this system which is failing rapidly, basically a hand out as they're going down the river into the flood stream. Because the banking system, the energy system, none of them are sustainable under present conditions. You said this years ago, and, and it's always stuck in my mind that under digital conditions, these systems couldn't continue to exist anymore. No, we are right. now seeing the fulfilling of that moment, James. Yeah, I said many years ago on the radio that, you know, when you have the electrocution of money and the electrocution of information and you have lawmakers that can hypothecate information in the form of printing money or debt, it's not really money, just debt, through computers, you don't have an economy anymore. It's over. So what you've got is the people that control the law control the printing presses and therefore controlling the hypothecation of the money through the energy system, they can buy up the world and take over. And that is exactly what's happened or the attempt thereof has happened because you've got some companies that are monsters in terms of how much money they have, their participation in the hypothecation of that money. You've got the complete total corruption of central banking through the Bank of International Settlements for the World Bank and IMF. It's a complete total disaster. And most of America still doesn't understand. We haven't, the debt is not, we're not reducing it. We're making it bigger. It's not going away. What are they going to do? They're, they're, they're probably going to have to cancel all of the debt. But I don't think they're going to do that until they, you know, you, you know as well as I know, well, they're, they're not going to just let us so uh, let us go with two hundred and fifty trillion. And remember now, that part of that debt is uh, invisible for an alternate civilization that's uh, you know been hiding in the winds. Wings. That's, right. that's right. Yeah, and that civilization, by the way, has been using something akin to a cryptocurrency system. That's how they've been able to hide in plain view for so long. One of those dirty little secrets out there that doesn't get mentioned very often, right? But so it it's 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 a uh, every time I walk into a bank or see somebody using a credit card or a debit card, I always go back to the fact that that's a that's a uh, electrical signal. Mm -hmm. There there is no security in any banking anywhere. Period. Every major bank has been broken into. We've got, I mean, this, the, 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 the problem with all the movement of information from point A to point B in the world of finance, uh, it could be the liberation of the people because I don't care who stands up and says we've got the most secure system, da, 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 da. Uh, that just isn't true. Well, here again, you know, we have this moment in time, this window 
And this window, as nearly as I can tell, we're looking at 18 to 24 months uh, for the crypto world to make or break. We're going to find out what this thing is in approximately that window of time. That's not my number. That's numbers that have been trotted out by other pundits on the scene. So essentially, the crypto world right now is inverted. It is basically creating money literally not only out of nothing, but literally out of a nothing that nobody understands. Exactly. When, when, <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> when you, now, if we, if we flip the equation and we bring in the cold energy, the, the, the cold fusion, the Leonard, uh, the ancillary energy products that can get us through a transition. If we monetize that in a crypto system that is secure, now you have an inherent value inside of an entirely new economic environment that's never existed before. The, the economy of energy itself, humanely distributed through a system that no longer has third-party interlopers and isn't open to the type of exploits that have been going on in the banking system, certainly since the 1980s when Promise Software was hijacked by the Justice Department. So we have a secure system, we have a way to monetize, and we have the source of something that's so fundamental that anybody can get it. You turn on your light bulb, that is value. And this Exactly. This is the message, and this is me, this is not you, I'm not projecting this, but I think you agree with me, that if we get this concept across, we have the opportunity to cross the Rubicon of two communities that so far have not really intermingled with each other, the free energy people and the crypto communities, because I think their goals are largely the same. Oh, they are. That I do know. After speaking with some of the people in that, that world, they uh, feel the much the same way I do and you do and many, 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 many people all over the world feel they've had enough of uh, all the, 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 uh, the true terrorists of the world, the international bankers that finance it all. Uh, they've had enough. And I see this as a potential, I hope it's the door that we can collectively walk through to get the job done. And I'm going to be posing some pretty hard questions to the MIT people, um, not to see if they have answers technologically, but to see where their answers um, originate from. Are they, are they uh, heartfelt answers or are they on somebody's payroll or is it political? Because at this point, um, uh, I'm going to be very interested to see um, the attitude of the most prestigious technical college in the world showing up to the, the poorest uh, sovereign nation under genocide that is fighting for the right to exist. So it's these, when you take those two elements and synthesize them, I'm very interested to see what ideas and what uh, resolution is going to occur and how the White House is going to respond to this and the, and the Department of Energy and uh, companies like Berlin Energy that are sitting on this and um, uh, need the proper financing to uh, deploy and all the benefits that that's going to bring. And a lot of people have, seem to think that as soon as this arrives, that all the oil companies are finished. No, we will go through the process of emergence and it will be a slow and steady stream and it will improve and there will be mistakes and there will be improvements and it will go through the standard uh, things, the process that uh, uh, what we call emergence um, happens when we deploy new technology into the world. Well, I think, you know, it's myopic to think that, that change isn't going to come. And as I said earlier, there's this opportunity right now. This, this may surprise a few people out there because I've been highly critical of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin specifically. My criticism behind it has largely been the intentionality behind the system and not the system itself. I am not a technophobe. So the intentionality behind this new system has to be distinctively different from the intentionality that has been uh, the burden of the Western world for the last, 
150 years under this present system of usury, exploitation of the earth, exploitation of the people, abuse of resources, abuse of uh, technologies. These are the things that we're looking at in an integrated sense now, and we have the opportunity to have this conversation on a broad scale and to begin to reformulate a strategy that doesn't discount past technology. I mean, most people don't realize that coal technology, it's actually still being used. I grew up in uh, sort of the end of the era when people were burning coal. But in fact, we're still talking and still actively mining coal to this very day for a multitude of uses. The petroleum industry won't go away because it's a chemical industry and we require it in order to create all manner of industrial goods and services. So nobody gets relegated to dinosaur status here. It's simply a matter of transition, and that transition is handled over a long period of time. This doesn't threaten anybody's paradigm except for criminals. Precisely. And there you have it. That's the whole thing wrapped up in a nice little bow right there. Is This is like we've discussed before long ago, the, the, the true currency is integrity. Yeah, and but the, pe- but, but the people have to demand it. They have to demand it, and that's all it comes down to, really. Yeah, uh, because yeah. what there there is not enough noise made out there uh, by informed people having to do with these particular points, especially um, f- free energy. I mean, I I know that uh, in the next couple of months, uh, when they begin the uh, kind of pre-publicity on the documentary. There's going to be a documentary that I'm in, several of them, but one of them is called End of the Line. And it's going to include the hidden ground of what took place at Standing Rock, which was the fact that resolution and getting answers to these problems are available. And they're not being widely circulated enough. You know, us discussing this here, uh, it's a start, but people have to start. It's a start. Yeah, it's a start. Yeah, it's a start. And I'm hoping, and I'm, I tend to think after speaking with uh, government people um, from Africa, uh, very honestly and openly to them, um, they it, it was clear as day to them that yes, we need to integrate free energy. Yes. Free energy should be activated and be the energy source for cryptos. And yes, we need to rethink who our uh, legislators are surrounding. They're not bankers in the typical sense. Bankers, they're finished. They're dead. You guys are finished. Have a nice day. It's over. That's not going to be how it flies. (laughs) Absolutely. Man, I told you a long time ago that I would end it all for those guys. Those guys are they're they're in museums now. They're antiques. They're finished. It's there's the, the, a banker in the typical sense uh, doesn't exist anymore because we have this new beginning of uh, the crypto world. It just needs to be. Um, I think it needs to be uh, discussed more and um, more character and integrity needs to be put into it. And if that's the case, uh, everybody's got a chance. Maybe it might be useful at this point too, James, to talk a little bit about, because there's a piece of background here, and we've talked about it before, but you know, as you well know, it's a moving parade out there in media. The vision uh, that Russell Means kind of bequeathed in terms of his desire uh, to see specifically the Lakota Sioux, the Native people gifted with this form of, of energy. Yeah, this when I was when I first met you, I was taking down all the credit card companies. I beat every major credit card company. I was hammering the uh, banks having to do with mortgages, and and it just and it, I had to prove and show to everybody that one, you can't have uh, uh, an economy under electrical conditions in a typical sense under the way that it was done and under a. a Uh, a system that's underway that the Federal Reserve is using. So I proved that. But while I was doing that, um, I also was contacted by Russell Means, and he asked me to come uh, talk to him about what I was doing with the banks when I was taking them all down. 
And in those discussions, I said, you know, I explained, you know, this is what's going to happen in the future. And people are going to figure this out sooner or later. And his main goal was, one, freedom, two, the Constitution, three, a complete total harmony between energy, earth, and commerce with the Republic of Lakota. Because he had just, at that time, had just returned from the UN where he changed his uh, legal status. Um, and I sat down with him, and it was, it was really him that uh, asked me to uh, put the LENR situation on the map through the, through the vision of the Lakota Sioux, because ultimately, you know, he was not only concerned about fairness, equality, and justice, but also um, uh, harmony with the planet and preserving the planet for future generations and not destroying it. Um, so when he asked me a long time ago, it seems, to uh, bring that to fruition, uh, this energy conference is part of that. Uh, he, he will be there in spirit for sure. His name will be mentioned for sure. And um, I think that um, to, the, to the, all the people that came to Standing Rock and all the supporters and everything that was there and all that was done, and the many, many months that people protested and protected the water protectors and so forth, this is a result of that, a, a, a possible answer, a fix, so to speak, of creating a situation under the Republic of Lakota, which would be the, kind of like the model for other countries. That's really what the, what uh, is happening is they're trying to set up a situation where they have balance with the earth and have a, and have a, a economy. Right now, I mean, one of the things that's going to be on the plate there is they're going to have to get rid of, they're, they're dumping the Federal Reserve there. They're out. They, they have to because they uh, have been pushed against the wall and they're going to have to reconstruct how they uh, have currency with their casinos and with their land and everything because they, they've had enough. They've been pushed so far, so hard against the wall that they're going to, they, they will end up probably being some of the pioneers of the things that we're discussing here today. Yeah. All of that. I, 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 I get excited thinking about it. The, the other person that I think deserves mention here is uh, Wesley Clark Jr., who was a year ago uh, out there shoulder to shoulder. Um, yeah, let me, let me explain why and how that happened. For the record, one more time. I was discussing with Phyllis Young, who greenlit the whole thing, what to do because uh, – all the uh, aggression in the military and the guns and the tanks and everything was uh, brewing and getting worse and worse and worse. And I said, something's going to happen. P people are going to start getting killed. If something isn't done there. Something has got to be done, something major, something radical, because you know the U.S. government, nobody else was coming to help. Nobody, not one person. So I got a call from a contact in D.C. And um, she said, go talk to Wesley Clark, Jr., and uh, I didn't know him. Uh, I knew who his father was. His father's uh, a Wesley Clark Sr., the general, former uh, NATO Supreme Commander, Allied Supreme Commander, huge guy in D.C., huge guy in the military. And uh, I called him up. He took my call. I said what was going on. And then I went to go meet him at his home. I met his wife, met his kids. And then I sat down and uh, start to sort of kind of uh, – assess his character right who who he was what he mm -hmm. what he knew and let me tell you something he didn't know anything about american indian culture at all except the broad strokes but here's what he did know and this is why i uh put him on the phone with phyllis and the lakota in the first place and this is an important factor to discuss he's the only white man and military man ever to tell me face to face, the first thing we need to do when we get there is apologize to what we have done to them. And that is why I told Phyllis, let him do his thing. Let's bring the vets in. 
That is why the whole thing happened is because he said, we have to apologize to the people for what we have done to them. We have destroyed them. We have ignored them. We've, they're dying here. They're living under genocide. This is un unacceptable. These are Americans. These people are pay taxes. They go to fight our wars and we're ignoring them and we're killing them. And that was his primary motivation is to apologize to them. Hence, when they did the healing ceremony, uh, which was seen all over the world, it was on the cover of the LA Times, that was his idea. That really was his idea. And he uh, deserves the credit for that. That was a big thing for him to do. And he got into a lot of trouble for that. A lot of trouble. Yeah, but I, I remember seeing him after we returned from Standing Rock and... He went on um, the Young Turks and did a little bit of publicity on it and said it was the best thing he ever did in his entire life. And the Lakota Sioux uh, are honoring him at this conference. And if you notice on the artwork in the bottom right-hand corner, it says in honor of Wesley Clark Jr. because he, uh, he really, um, not only did he make history, but he uh, put his own life at stake because he it got de death it. threats. This yeah, it cost him. him. Yeah. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And I'll never forget that because he he went to their aid without really knowing anything about them at all. He didn't know anything. And when he got there, he assembled all those people. I remember arriving on the plane there and there were vets. I could hear them talking. And what was interesting to me is because they were saying, this is the best thing we've ever done. That's what I heard it all the time. And then when I saw an 89 year old man roll in on a wheelchair in a, out, coming out of a snowstorm with his wife uh, saying he wouldn't miss this for anything in the world. It was the best thing he'd ever done his entire military career. So he magic was made there. Uh, it's because of Wesley Clark Jr. Having the guts to initiate all that. And I, I'll never forget him. I consider him a brother. And this is why this uh, conference is taking place. This really is an opportunity for, I would say, a new renaissance in terms of changing the fundamentals of our society and our culture in a positive way. And uh, so, James, I, you know I've always supported what you do in any way I possibly can. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard struggle, the things that you're doing, the things that people in the background are going through. But this is actually an outreach to a number of communities, uh, the, the, the free energy people and the crypto people are the people that I hope will hear this and sit down and think about what we've talked about as an integrative aspect of pulling together the most positive things coming from our present technological era. Um, to me, this is exciting. I know you're going to be speaking out this year. I'm uh, tentatively booked now to speak in Copenhagen in September, and I, this is going to be a prominent part of any uh, talk that I give as well. We need to push this out. The people who hear this, share the podcast, share this with friends and family, and sit down and talk about this. And, and we need a positive vision for the future. And, and, I, and I, I look at this, the, the, the artwork, and I'll put this up with this show, to the uh, Energy Summit. And I kind of get a little bit of a goosebump of hope that maybe somehow this is the beginning of a change that's been coming for a long time. I think, uh, ironically, I think you are correct. I have a good feeling about it because the, the, the Lakota Sioux, um, there's something magical about those people and everybody that was there knows it. And so I, I, I tend to agree with you 100%. Anything else we want to cover before we wrap this today, James? Thank you for doing this for me. I appreciate it. It's my, my pleasure, my friend. You know that. Uh, this, is, this is where our minds meet every time we talk. It's been awesome having you back, kind of summarizing some things in the past, projecting into the future and talking about it. Um, James, give, give people your contact information, website, whatever you want to put out there. It's jamesmartinezmedia.net, and I can be reached at jamesmartinezmedia at gmail. There you go. All right, my friend. I wish you well in your present endeavors. Keep us updated, and uh, we'll talk again soon. 
And that's going to wrap it for this time. I'm Randy Moggins for Off Planet Media. We'll be back with another show very soon. The truth is out there. It is inside you. Now go and sow the seeds. This is Off Planet Radio.